Well, as always, it is a privilege to get to open up the word for us. Last week, Eric got us back into our David series, and he suggested, why don't you teach on a psalm? And I like that idea, but here's the thing. The last person to teach on a psalm was Julia Davis, who translated Psalm 23 into English from the original Hebrew. So you know what I need us all to do this morning? I need us all to lower our expectations. Like, there was no translating of Hebrew going on this week, although I have prepped thoroughly in English. We're just going to go ahead and jump right in. I saw something in myself about a month ago. Maybe you will relate. I believe in God, but I don't trust him. I believe in God, but I don't trust him. This was not something that I wanted to see in myself, but it was the only thing that acknowledged what was my inward reality, that I am believing in him, but I don't trust him. You ever have those times where things are going on inside of you and around you, and you're not questioning whether or not God exists? Like, you know he's still there. He didn't go anywhere. But you're just like, I don't trust you right now. And I was experiencing none of what I would call the byproducts of trust, joy, comfort, and steadiness. My response to what life was throwing at me was revealing a big trust deficit. And in a room this size, there are a lot of people who believe in God. But there may also be a lot of people who are not trusting him. And if that's you this morning, I'm with you. You know, I I don't think anyone can walk with Jesus for longer than a minute and not butt up against a time where trust seems out of reach. So this morning is going to be all about trust. Psalm 20, which is funny because this is not the psalm I wanted to preach on. It has never been one of my favorites. In fact, it's in a category of psalms that is my least favorite. But Psalm 20 has met me, and my hope is that as we go through it this morning, what the Lord has shown me would either help you as you continue to trust God or perhaps begin trusting him again. So would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? You can follow along with me either on the screens or in your own Bible. I will be reading from the English Standard Version This is Psalm 20, verses 1 through 9. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. O Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. You may be seated. Psalm 20 is a royal psalm of David, and it was penned sometime before going into battle, but we're not sure of the exact circumstances of this psalm. And it's divided into three sections. The first is where the people of God are talking. Then the second section, it's either the priest or the king speaking. And then at the end, it returns back to the people. And back in David's time, kings represented the people, and the people reflected the king. So even though there's different voices throughout the psalm, all of it has something to offer us. Psalm 20, like all 150 psalms, is a gift to the people of God for all time. So what does Psalm 20 say 
about trust? Well, first, trust is cultivated through worshiping God's name. Before we were born, our parents give a lot of thoughts to our names. And they probably started with a list of no's. So maybe dad throws out Patrick. And mom's like, mm, I knew a weird Patrick back in second grade, so no. And th- you know, but then finally, they decide on the name. My name, Ian, means God is gracious. That's pretty cool. God is gracious. But it also means, and I'm ready for the collective eye roll, my name also means gift of God. That's right, it's allowed to laugh. Like this stuff, to, this is just too perfect. Thanks, mom and dad. Names are powerful. When we hear the name of someone who's had an impact on our life, maybe positive or negative, we react, right? Maybe you had a friend and you lose touch with them. You don't hear their name for a long time. And then out of the blue, someone says their name and a certain emotion is drawn up. That's the power of of a name. And if people's names are that powerful, how much more so the name of God? Verse 1 says, there's a problem. It's a day of trouble. But then this, may the name of the God of Jacob protect you. God's name is all of who he is, like his character, his attributes, Loving, faithful, true, just. Anything that is true of God is his name. The God of Jacob, a name that he chooses to go by, is kind of surprising because Jacob, as seen in the middle of Genesis, isn't all that great. So the name God of Jacob, it actually tells us something about who God is. It tells us he's not deterred from associating with people who have great fault and great sin. Every name of God communicates something about who he is. And just like we respond to people's names, we respond to God's name one way or another. We will either receive it or we reject it because the power of his name demands a response. In Psalm 20, Israel's response to God's name is worship. Verse 3, the people remind God of the king's offerings and sacrifices and of the worship that was going on in Zion and in the sanctuary. Worship was happening under David's reign, and the people are now pointing back to it. I think we need to put ourselves in that position where we're able to point back to worship that's been ongoing in our lives. Because there's something about having a history of worship that does cultivate trust. There is something about returning over and over and over again to the name of God, to who he really is, not just what we've started to create him to be, but to who he really is, and it creates trust. David puts a Selah after verse 3. And if you remember, at the beginning of this year, we actually took some time to teach on what does Selah mean, and it means to pause. So it's only fitting that after invoking God's name and pointing to worship, that David puts a pause to emphasize its importance, that we can't move forward until all of this sinks in. Personally, I love how verse two points to the sanctuary because it tells us how important what we do together here on Sunday mornings is. Now, I'm one of those people that is annoying, always making noise, always singing. I mean, it doesn't annoy me, but it annoys other people, right? (laughs) And that's something that's gonna play out then in my favor because in the Psalms, you can't get away from the fact that God wants to be sung to. He wants the people of God to be a singing people. So there's a song that I first heard at the Passion Conference a couple years back. And lately, because of where I've been, I've returned to it repeatedly because it's worship, it focuses on God's name, and because I have been needing to rebuild trust. So kind of right here in the song, we're going to take a little pause. I want you to watch this video. It's from the Passion Conference. I got to be there with some of our students and it talks about the worthiness of God's name. Take a look. He is worthy of his name. 
and trust is cultivated through worshiping his name. Trust also requires a heart change. So about a month ago, I was headed downtown Indianapolis to grab dinner with a friend, and as I was paying the parking meter, some guy pulls up right next to me, and I'm like, man, that guy looks familiar. Then all of a sudden, I realize, that's Andrew Luck. (laughs) Now, it's a small chance that I would recognize any football player, especially a Colts player, (laughs) but... This was a proud personal moment that I recognized Andrew Luck. So immediately I start thinking, oh, should I talk to him? Can I get a selfie? But I was like, I'm going to play it cool. I'm just going to start walking. So I'm walking. Next thing I realize, we are going to the same restaurant. Like, man, we both got good taste. We are going to the same place. But still, I'm like, playing it cool. I'm going to walk. He's just a couple paces behind me. So it's awkward. It's in silence. And I'm trying to see, like, is he still there? Then finally, I build up the courage, like, I'm going to talk to him, and I bring up Pastor Eric because that's an easy in, and we had a conversation. That was a Friday. The next day, Andrew Luck retired from football. (laughs) I know. I don't know what I did. (laughs) Everyone, like everyone, was immediately bummed and disappointed. That makes sense. It was a shock. It was a bummer. But quickly, two different groups of people emerged. A big group of people, sorry, a big group of people had a change of heart. You know, they saw his press conference. They remembered the Andrew Luck that they had come to know and love. And they trusted him to make the decision. They trusted that he was doing what was best for him, his family, maybe even the team. But then there was this other group of people that did not have a heart change. (laughs) They couldn't let it go, you know, right? They did not trust him to make the decision. All they could think of how it was going to affect them. So no heart change, definitely no trust. Trust is usually preceded by a heart change. And in Psalm 20, we don't see the heart change itself taking place, but we do see the end result of a heart change that has already happened. If you want to know what's in your heart, look at what you're asking for. If we want to know what's in our hearts, look at what we're asking for. So in verses 4 and 5, we see what the people of God were asking for. They say, may he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all all your petitions. The people could have asked for any number of things, but they're asking for the king's plans to be met, for salvation, to be able to make God's name famous by setting up banners in his name. Their heart change is seen in what they were asking and how they were asking. The what victory over God's enemies who would have profaned his name and then the how sacrifice prayer worship and obedience trust requires a heart change if we're not trusting it is time to take a look at our hearts and if we want to know what's in our hearts we should look at what we're asking for To help us grab hold of what that kind of looks like, here's a couple of examples. It would be the difference between coming to God in prayer out of worship versus only ever coming to him out of convenience. It would be the difference between my laundry list of wants and what Jesus taught us to pray in the Sermon on the Mount. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And perhaps most clearly, you you guys remember the prayer of Christ in the garden before he was to go to the cross. What does he pray? He prays that God would remove this cup from him. It is an honest prayer. He's like, Father, if I don't have to die, would you do that? But then, of course, it's followed up by, not my will, but yours. 
for those of us who are, you know, those paid Christian sorts, that's so dangerous for us because we know that prayer. We will tack that prayer on to things. But there can be that difference between just saying it and meaning it. Charles Spurgeon once said, we may have our own will when our will is God's will. And Psalm 20 is this snapshot of what it's like when everything is as it should be. Trust that's stemming from and flowing from a heart change. You know, sometimes the reason we don't trust God is that our hearts have stopped changing. You know, we still believe, we know Jesus, but somewhere along the way, our hearts started to drift. It started to become more about us. You know, we got busy, we got distracted. And sometimes it's not that we don't trust God's power to do things. It's that we, tr- we don't trust his heart. We know that he can do a great work in our lives, but we no longer trust that he wants to do it. And man, that will mess with our trust. I know that in the times when I find myself, you know, no longer trusting the Lord and still believing in him, somewhere along the way, my prayers started becoming less informed by his name and more informed by me and my problems. And that's why we started with verses one through three, worship that is so crucial, that reorders the heart and allows the spirit to change us, that is where it begins. Our heart change will allow us to trust the process, trust the timing, and trust the decision. Our heart change allows us to trust the process, trust the timing, and trust the decision. And lastly, trust expands through shared history. Verse six is where the psalm switches and the king starts speaking. He says, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. How does David know that? He knows it because the Lord has done it before. They have shared history. So that story of David and Goliath, trust builder. David defeating the Amalekites, shared history. David beating the Philistines, more shared history. David knew that God would answer him from his holy heaven and hold him up with his mighty right hand because of shared history. Two weeks ago, our high school students got to walk through something together. And there's a couple of pictures on the screen that we're gonna just kind of take you through. What we were doing was a walkthrough of Psalm 139. And we had four different worship stations to do it. So these pictures show that the students would get up and read whatever portion. There was times of prayer. And of course, we had then these different things. A worship station, if you're not familiar with what that is, all it is is something that we plan out to help people engage with the Lord, to help them focus, to walk them through something. So that's what you see here. The first worship station we prompted them to look back on the last 12 months and pick a time when they remember God coming through for them. To pick one time when they saw God move in their lives. So we had them think about it. And then in the back of the loft, we had these calendars put up and they would simply grab a sticker and put it in the place where they remember God having moved in their lives. And this is what it looked like when they were done. So here, I'll let the camera kind of catch up with me. Here it is in September. You see some of these these dots right here. August, this one was kind of cool to look at because here, this is Summer Bash baptism service. July, June, talk about the power of what God does in Ignite Camp. Lots of things from that week. Each sticker representing a student's shared history. Each sticker, I love this, there's one in April, one is enough. Each sticker representing a time that a student could look back on and know that God has come through for them. We need to take time to look back on our shared history. It will expand our trust. 
If you've never paid attention to your shared history, look back on certain dates, look back on memories of God coming through for you, I encourage you to take the time to do it. You might be surprised by what God does to expand your trust. If you're a Christ follower in this room, you have at least one amazing shared history moment. That first time that you trusted that God is who he says he is and can do what he says he can. And then there's bound to be more and more stories after that. Because we know that the longer that we walk with the Lord, the more shared history that we will have together. So what can you look back on? What's your shared history with the Lord. Verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Chariots and horses, they, those were the pinnacle of warfare. And the Israelites would have felt especially threatened by those things because their military was lacking in that area. When we find ourselves believing in God but not trusting him, it means that our trust has been going somewhere else. Our trust has been going towards chariots and horses. Good times will not tend to reveal where we're really putting our trust. That's what bad times do. Some of us, and I count myself in this, some of us have been trusting in chariots and horses for a long time, and we didn't even really quite realize it. Your job, friends, money, your spouse, yourself, the government, all of it, all of it, chariots and horses. What are... What are some of ours? I think it would be better for us to use the good times to get addressed with those, to repent of those, to confess them, instead of being forced to confront them in those bad times. Only by returning over and over again to the name of God, by having that heart change that the Spirit does, And then looking back on our shared history, will we experience the richness of what it is not just to believe, but to also trust? Trust is cultivated through worshiping God's name. Trust requires a heart change, and trust expands through shared history. No matter who you are, you will probably find yourself in those stretches where trust seems just out of reach. And if any part of you relates to where I have been, I believe in God, but I don't trust him. Be encouraged because God is good and he is patient. He wants you to trust him, but actually more importantly, even than that, he will show us how to trust him. And remember that his goodness does not depend on whether we're trusting him or not. You know, think about it. God is in the business of demonstrating his goodness regardless of where we are at. You know, how many times did he perform miracles when there was barely any belief? How many times does he use broken people to accomplish his kingdom purposes? And then for myself, how many times did he still choose to use me the last 30 days when I can barely get it together? He is good. And he will show us how to trust him. That's what Psalm 20 has meant for me recently. It's meant that return to the worship of who God really is. And as a pastor, there's all these like worship times already built into my life and that's facilitated for me. So this, this return to worship has been largely personal, right? It's been early mornings in my study It's been playing the same song over and over and over again in my car. So like that song I played earlier, that's real. That's me in the car shedding man tears, which is a thing, shedding those tears as God is building trust. And then heart change. If I want to know 
what is in my heart. I have to look at what I am asking for. My prayers are shifting slowly. (laughs) There are still a lot of selfish prayers going up. And the great thing is, that's okay, because that is all a part of it. But my prayers are starting to be aligned more with who God says he is. My asks are shifting where it isn't so much all of my desires, but that open-handed prayer of God ultimately, which is so hard to pray, God, ultimately, I want your will to be done in my life and in the lives of those around me. Worship team, you guys can start to come back up. The shared history thing, though, that has been what's been most impactful. My shared history tells me a lot of things. It tells me that when God interrupts my life, it's better. God interrupted my life at age 16, and it forever changed my world. And then at 25, as a young pastor going through my first kind of like serious betrayal, and my shared history shows me that God will fight for me. I need only be still. And I've been in Indy for four and a half years now, and God has been doing incredible things, things I didn't even see coming, both in ministry and out of ministry. But you know what? My plans for my life involved never going to Indiana, sorry Hoosiers, (laughs) and never doing student ministry. (laughs) I'm so serious, like that's that's what it was. It's like, sorry high school students, I love you, I just didn't know how much I was going to love you. (laughs) My plans for my life did not involve those things. But as I look back on my shared history, you can imagine the release, the trust that just expands as I'm reminded that no matter what is thrown at me, the same God, same history, and he is there with me. So I believe in God, but I don't trust him I know that I will be returning to Psalm 20 over and over again. It's a journey. But God is showing me how to trust him. And it's my hope that for all of us, you know, individually and as a church, Eagle Church, that we would not settle for just belief, but that we would go after what it is to experience trust to its fullest. Why don't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we recognize you as the one who is good, who is unchanging, or who is glorious and beautiful and beyond our ability to comprehend. And Lord, we recognize that there are times where trust is so hard to grab hold of. It might be something little. It might be something big. Lord, we know that there are big things happening within our body. And Lord, it is hard to trust. I think at the root of it, it's hard to trust when certain things happen that we know wouldn't wouldn't normally be aligned with what you would desire, and yet you still allow it. But Lord, we know that we can come to you as the one who is sovereign. You will change our hearts. You will remind us of our shared history. You will show us how to trust you again. Lord, we ask that as we respond in worship, in singing, in a a way that you have invited and welcomed over and over again, Lord, I ask that just immediately that you would prick our hearts towards trust, that you would do the things that only you can do. Lord, I pray that we would be a church where we aren't walking around simply as people who believe in God, but that we live and move and have our being as those who trust you. And lift all of this up in Jesus' name, amen.